pick a key. <laughs> and may all your Christmases be, be, no, be, <laughs> cinnamon. <laughs> Hello, everybody. It is time now for my 2015 Big 12 Bowl Preview Show, in which I will preview all the bowl games involving Big 12 schools. That is all except for one. That's Oklahoma and Clemson. I will give it its own separate preview show um, later in the month. Okay, so make sure you check back on this webpage for that. Of course, OU Clemson is a college football playoff game, one of the uh, two semifinal games with um, Michigan State and Alabama being the other. But again, I will preview Oklahoma and Clemson uh, during the latter half of December. So please check that out. Sooners are a slight favorite to win that game. Now, let's go ahead and talk about the Sugar Bowl. You know, I'm sure at the beginning of December, before Baylor played Texas, I'm sure Oklahoma State was thinking, okay, we're going to go to either San Antonio or Orlando to play in either the Alamo or Russell Luck Lake Bowl. It looks evident. And then another team that wears orange came through. For Oklahoma State, fittingly. Texas beating Baylor that first Saturday of December allowed Oklahoma State to move up in the standings, or in this case, uh, move into a second place tie with TCU. And of course, they beat the Horn Frogs head to head. So, as a result, Oklahoma State got a major bowl bid, New Orleans and the Sugar Bowl, the second time in the coaching career of Mike Gundy that he's guided his pokes to a big time bowl game. That's the good news. The not so good news is you got to play the Ole Miss Rebels, who are not only a pretty, you know, they're, they're a pretty complete football team, as well as a, a balanced team offensively with the run and pass, but also they've been a thorn in the side of Oklahoma State when it comes to uh, bowl games. Um, they, they flat out have. I mean, Oklahoma State just seems to fall on the short end of the stick when it comes to playing Ole Miss in postseason. And this matchup, it doesn't look particularly well. For the Cowboys. I mean, yeah, granted, it's going to help to have Mason Rudolph back. You know, he had the broken bone in his foot. Um, he, he only played three plays against Oklahoma and probably shouldn't play any, considering that all three of his passes were incomplete and one was uh, returned by the Sooners for a pick six. Um, J.W. Walsh, very effective as a runner, as a you know, quarterback. And in fact, he's probably their, their, their best rusher for Oklahoma State. Um, they'll definitely need him in short yardage in red zone situations. But again, it does help to have Rudolph back. But in spite of that, you got to be thinking, okay, what does Ole Miss do real well? They stop the run. They contain the run. So Oklahoma State, to me, cannot win this game just by being past happy. And at the same time, they can't win this game playing the defense that we've seen the last two games for the Cowboys. I mean, Baylor absolutely torched them. And if you saw the Bedlam game, you know what Oklahoma did to them. So Oklahoma State defensively comes in with absolutely no momentum. Glenn Spencer's defense will have to take chances. They will have to force turnovers to have a prayer in this game. Um, I think Ole Miss wins this one by at least 10 points. I just think the uh, Rebels are going to have too much in this one. One matchup to keep in mind, though, um, and this will be kind of fun to watch because you'll see these two guys in the NFL. Emmanuel Ogba, the defensive end for Oklahoma State, a supreme pass rusher, gets to the quarterback and gets to the quarterback often. And he'll go against a uh, future NFL player, offensive tackle, Larry McTunsil, for the Rebels. So that's a matchup to watch out for. Now let's talk about the Russell Athletic Bowl and the Baylor Bears. And they're going to be thinking what might have been if it weren't for injuries. Can you think of a team in college football that was more decimated by the injury bug than Baylor? I, I can't think of any, especially at quarterback. You know, first half of the season, they're rolling. Nobody can stop them offensively. And Seth Russell was a big reason why. But then, you know, once we found out before that Kansas City, the Kansas City, Kansas State game in mid-November that he was unavailable because of his neck, uh, yeah, a little wind was taken out of the sail. And Grant Jarrett Stitham, you know, did an admirable job. Uh, but even he fell victim to the injury buck. And then third-string quarterback Chris Johnson, who did some good things against Oklahoma State in the second half of that Baylor win in Stillwater, against Texas, he got hurt early, and Baylor is down to their four-screen quarterback, their emergency quarterback, who's a wide receiver by title. So you, you can tell that Baylor had problems. And, you know, when you lose to Texas, that, that really sinks it even worse because this Texas team wasn't worth a damn. And yet Texas beats Oklahoma and Baylor, a couple of top-ten squads this year, 
and beat them in the same season. So go figure that out. But the injuries played that big of a role to where even Texas took advantage of it. So the big question I have for Baylor, even though they're a slight favorite entering this game, a three-point favorite, to play in the Russell Athletic Bowl in Orlando against North Carolina, does Baylor care? Does Baylor care about this game? Because let's face it, at the beginning of the season, this was not the bowl game they were looking for. And nobody knew that North Carolina was going to be 11-2 and when the Coastal Division and play with them one touchdown of Clemson. And in my opinion, North Carolina at the end of that game got screwed um, against Clemson because, you know, North Carolina recovered an onside kick. But the official, who had Mr. Magoo eyes, said that, you know, North Carolina was offside. And, you know, replay showed that he wasn't. So, you know, at least North Carolina should have had a chance on that last possession to see what might have happened. We don't know, but now we'll never know. So, North Carolina, Marquise Williams, a, a terrific quarterback. You know, you know, Ryan Schwartz is one of his favorite targets. So, North Carolina offense under Larry Fedora has turned things around, and they've been lethal. I think North Carolina, just from what I've seen these past few weeks for both teams, considering both momentum and especially health, North Carolina has the edge in this game. And I think North Carolina will probably have more fan support. It's not as far of a trip to Orlando for North Carolina as it is for Baylor. And let's face it, this is not the bowl game Baylor was looking at. Not to say that Baylor won't have offensive success. I think defensively, they're going to be very vulnerable in this game. And going back to Baylor offensively, if Chris Johnson got hurt again, then you're back to your emergency quarterback. And it's going to basically be the Texas game all over again. I think North Carolina wins. The Alamo Bowl. TCU and Oregon, and this thing spells points like you cannot believe. And it helps for TCU to get some players back. And I know that you might be thinking, if you're a Baylor fan, well, you know, TCU is at injuries. So, you know, why would you contemplate maybe thinking that TCU has a shot in this one when you're not giving Baylor a shot in their game? The difference is that TCU is getting two of their big-time players back. You know, and, you know Josh Doxson, the first-team um, All-American wideout, as well as Trevon Boykin, uh, they're all-everything quarterback. They're getting those guys back, and they've had, they've had some time to rest. Also, this is almost going to be like a home game for TCU. Not that far of a trip from Fort Worth down I-35 South to San Antonio. And I think this is a good big, big game as far as recruiting as well because of how heavily you know TCU recruits naturally in the Texas area. But Oregon, you know, they're probably a very underrated school when it comes to recruiting in Texas. They get, they get their share of talent from the Lone Star State. So, you know, Oregon playing in San Antonio, um, that will really help the, uh, the, the Ducks name. So it'll help even more if they put on a terrific showing. These teams have had opposite seasons in terms of the wins. Now, TCU's 10-2, and two, but both of their losses occurred during the latter half of the season. For Oregon, they haven't lost a game since the first half of the season. I mean, the Ducks came into this one at uh, you know winning their last six, six-game winning streak after the 3-3 three and three start. And Vernon Adams is a big reason why. And I think also, too, Darren Carrington, the wideout for the Ducks. I mean, remember, he was suspended. You know, they got him back, and Oregon's offense has been elevated. Remember, along the way, you know, they, they took down both um, Stanford as well as uh, USC. So, Oregon, yeah, 9-3 and three may not be, by Oregon standards, a great year, but Mark Helfridge's team, you know, resurrected themselves and are playing with a lot more confidence. It's not that same team you saw in late September, early October. With that being said, though, I think TCU wins. It'll feel kind of like the home game for them. I think having Boykin back will make all the difference. I think uh, TCU will end their year, um, you know, with a bang and an 11-2 record. The Liberty Bowl, Kansas State versus Arkansas. Two teams that definitely know how to run the football, but in different ways. The Razorbacks are more of a power run attack, but also, too, they show balance. They can throw with Brandon Allen at QB. And, you know, Arkansas has played better ball the second half of the season after looking shaky in the first half, including a loss to Texas Tech earlier in the year and losing to Toledo. At that time, I'm sure Arkansas fans were ready to give, um, you know, their head coach, you know, uh, Rick Bielham of the boot. But uh, that team has turned things around, and, of course, that included, you know, you know, win at LSU. It's not ever easy to win in Baton Rouge. Kansas State, they had to win to basically guarantee themselves a bowl bid that last game, and they had to come from behind against West Virginia, and, you know, sure enough, when, um, you know, Kansas State's QB Huberter, um, you know, fell victim, Cody Cook came in in relief, and we know that Cook is a terrific all-around athlete, and that really probably threw West Virginia off, and Kansas State came from behind 
and pulled it off in the fourth quarter to get to six and six. And you have to wonder with Bill Snyder, you know, he's in his he's in his um, um, mid seventies age wise. You gotta wonder if this is his last game. Of course, you know, I haven't heard anything concrete about uh, one of the greatest coaches um, that we've seen in our generation um, retiring, but he's getting up there in years. And he's coached quite a few seasons in Manhattan. So you wonder, could this be it for uh, Bill Schneider? You know? And if it is, you know, thank you, Bill, for all you've done for college football. And, of course, he's responsible for the greatest turnaround in college football history when he took Kansas State, who was one of the worst teams, was the worst team in football back in the late 80s, and he made them into a winner. This Kansas State team, though, doesn't resemble those teams that he had with Darren Sproles, you know, with uh, Michael Beasley from back in the day. Okay, nothing like that. This is just what I would call a decent football team. But Kansas State, to me, is not good when it comes to throwing the football, and they're really bad when it comes to defending the pass. I think this is a matchup where if Kansas State wins, it's got to be about ball control. One of the best teams in the country when it comes to time of possession, 33 minutes per game is what they average. I just don't see Kansas State being able to handle uh, the power attack of Arkansas. And to me, Kansas State, I could see several three and outs in this game offensively, and I'll play right into Arkansas's hands. I just think Arkansas is a more talented team, and I think the Razorbacks win it. Cactus Bowl, got to talk about this matchup, West Virginia against Arizona State. And it, it is a home game for the Sun Devils playing this one in Tempe, Arizona. But West Virginia, this is a team that, have, have they underachieved? Well, maybe a little bit, considering, you know, all that we thought that they had back defensively, but they've been um, hurt a little bit with the injury bug as well. Uh, but offensively, you know, they probably done what we thought they were going to do. You know, Wendell Smallwoods had one heck of a year for the Mountaineers, uh, nearly 1,500 yards on the ground. And, of course, the play of Skylar Howard has been consistent as well. West Virginia, they've won the games that you thought they were going to win, with the exception of maybe Kansas State when they let that game slip out of their fingers. And then... Um, but, and they, but they've lost the games we thought they were going to lose, and that's what hurt them in midseason. But despite the loss at the end of the season, I do like what I've seen so far from West Virginia since midseason. They, they've played much better football, especially defensively. If you look at it from Arizona State's perspective, they have really underachieved. Some thought that Arizona State would, would win the South, if not come pretty close. And um, despite how good of a quarterback you know Mike Berkebici has been for Arizona State, um, and also the receiving of, um, of uh, Lucian. I still think that Arizona State defensively has problems, big-time problems. And remember, Arizona State has lost some games at home this season. So playing this one in their stadium, I don't think matters a whole lot because, you know, Arizona State has underachieved big-time. Six and six for this team. That was supposed to be a lot better under Todd Graham. I think West Virginia finds a way to get the win. And Texas Tech versus LSU to wrap it up in the Texas Bowl. Oh, boy. Um We'll start with the good for Texas Tech because there's good and bad in this matchup. The good thing is that LSU, they're, they're not used to playing against offenses that throw this much. And trust me, Cliff Kingsbury's uh, Red Raiders are going to throw quite a bit in this matchup. And really, um, if, if you're Texas Tech, you know you're going to give up some points. So you know that the offense cannot afford any three and outs. Even field goal attempts uh, might be costly in this one. So I do think Tech in the beginning will have offensive success. The problem is that Texas Tech from what I've seen, is the worst team in the country when it comes to stopping the run. They are horrible, and they're also bad when it comes to trying to hold a lead. Um, Leonard Fournette, the great running back for LSU, first-team All-American, needs, I think, about 220 yards to get to 2,000 yards for the year. You know the problem? If you're Texas Tech, you may not be able to hold him under 220 yards by the time the fourth quarter arrives. I think LSU will pound Texas Tech's defense, I do think Tech will get points. I don't see any way in Hades how Tech is going to be able to stop LSU, especially on the ground. It's a bad matchup for the Red Raiders as far as Texas Tech's defense against LSU's offense. LSU will win. Well, that's my preview of the six Big 12 Bowl games. Again, I did not preview Oklahoma Clemson. That will come at a later date. Thank you for watching my 2015 edition of the Big 12 Bowl preview. And don't forget, OU Clemson. My preview of that national semifinal coming up soon. So check back on this webpage. Happy holidays, everyone.